can start the recording. Okay. So, um, Nancy Bauer, I'm so glad to have you in the Festa della Filosofia. And uh, Nancy Bauer is currently Dean of QF, uh, TUFTS School of the Museum of Fine Arts and Dean in the Department of Arts and Sciences, a uh, position to which she was appointed in uh, 2012. And uh, she wrote uh, How to Do uh, Things with Pornography, uh, published by Harvard University Press in 2015, and Simone de Beauvoir, Philosophy and Feminism, uh, Columbia University Press in 2001. And uh, we will talk about this, about uh, um, feminism and uh, um, and you have always been concerned with the question uh, of how feminist philosophy can be understood without considering the expression and oxymoron or a contradiction. And uh, uh, you wrote, if philosophy is supposed to consist in investigating the most fundamental aspects of the world with a constantly open mind, how can a philosophical practice emanate and remain fast faithful to a political commitment. So uh, if you agree, I will start with this question and I uh, send it to you. Yeah, um, thank, first of all, thank you so much, Maura. I'm really excited um, to be here and to talk about my my work on, on Beauvoir um, and other things I, I imagine. Um, so the question of um, when I was writing um, the book Simone de Beauvoir, Philosophy and Feminism. It was actually, start, it started out as my doctoral dissertation and I wrote it um, in the early to mid nineties. And at that, and I was a student at Harvard. And at that time, even though I had some support in the department uh, for doing that work, um, I think um, that many people, many of the faculty members thought that I was basically deciding to leave the profession to write a dissertation on feminism. It just wasn't done, um, at least in that department and at least in the departments that are very powerful um, in the philosophy profession um, in the United States. But it, I had been a journalist and I had, I entered graduate school kind of late and I thought, I felt very strongly, I had been through two of um, incidents, ugly incidents of sexual harassment. And I had um, prosecuted both of those cases, which very few people did um, in the um, in the 1980s, which is uh, when I graduated from college. I had been a newspaper reporter um, and I worked in another setting, uh, uh, a, a setting in, within a hospital, writing a book um, that involved reporting about children's health. And in both cases, I experienced very, very bald faced, very open incidents of sexual um, harassment, particularly quid pro, pro, pro quo sexual harassment, meaning um, people said, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. And part of the reason I went to graduate school was to just forget about all of that. But over time, while I was in grad school, I started to think that I really wanted to think through um, that I really felt like feminism had to be part of philosophy or the kinds of things that I had been through would be considered sort of a generic, unfortunate, even potentially illegal action, but nothing special. Um, and so, but when I was doing this work, nobody had, there was one other person at the Harvard philosophy department who had done a, a um, dissertation uh, about 10 years earlier that had some feminism in it, but this was a whole book on not only not in an analytic philosophical um, vein, which is what uh, the major departments in the US do, uh, very driven by logic and perspicuous arguments and so forth, um, but also to write on Simone de Beauvoir, who at that time, very few people considered to be a philosopher. Um, they they thought of her as a woman who wrote some novels and some and the second sex, which was a book of her opinions about women that was out of date. Um, but what I thought about this book, um, I I I ended up reading um, the second sex, which I read a little bit of as an undergraduate, um, because I met Toral Moy, who's a name that may be familiar to you, who is a literary 
um, scholar at Duke University, but also very, very accomplished um, in thinking about philosophical topics. And she really encouraged me. It was just a coincidence that I happened to meet her to think about things philosophical. So the thing I was trying to think about was how can, at that time, was how can you make it the case that people see that adopting a feminist political view could actually be compatible with doing philosophy? I laugh when I think about this now because there's an enormous feminist uh, philosophy literature now, and nobody uh, nobody dares to ask that question anymore in most U.S. philosophy um, departments. But at the time, I was trying to figure out, like, how can I make this the fact of gender be something that's philosophically relevant, and how can I make it the case that one doesn't need to argue that being a woman poses a certain kind of problem for women in the world? I'll try not to have such long answers, but that is the that is the, the response. This is my second question, but um, before I want to uh, read um, a piece of your uh, sentence by you um, about this. Philosophers who reject the philosophy feminist philosophy, including the work that has been done on pornography and McKinnon over the past two decades, uh, they do it for essentially the same reason. They are reluctant, not because the arguments presented in philosophical publication feminist are a little weaker than any other repertoire of philosophical arguments, but because I am uncomfortable in seeing philosophy understood as a politically neutral neutral meet, method of investigation confused with concerns, policies that ultimately uh, motivate its authors. So it is important to me. But um, going to the Simone de Beauvoir philosophy and feminism, uh, in this book you begin by asking what a kind of a problem does being a woman pose? Okay. So um, where does this question come from and why is it so critical to ask it? So um, Simone de Beauvoir says in The Second Sex, she writes um, in the introduction to the book, which um, for anyone who might be um, here right now or listening to this or watching it, um, if you haven't uh, read The Second Sex, um, I urge you to read just the introduction to sort of get a sense of what's going on there. Um, and um, what she um, says in the introduction is, that uh, she makes a very sort of casual sentence that you might not even notice. Or she writes this sentence that says, a man never begins by establishing himself as an individual of a certain sex. It's not something a man would, uh, at least in the time that she wrote this in 1949, things in my opinion, thank God are getting a little better. But in, in 1949, no one would say, well, you know, let me see, what can I tell you about myself? Well, first of all, I'm a man. Um, but she said, so she said, a man never begins by establishing himself as an individual of a certain sex. His being a man poses, poses no problem. So my book, Simone de Beauvoir, Philosophy and Feminism, starts ask, out by asking the question, okay, so then what kind of a problem do women, does being a woman pose? And um, I really believe that um, the second sex remains the best book we have um, to think about that question. And that's true, even though um, the problem of being a woman has become much more uh, in, in very good ways, in my opinion, complicated, because now it turns out uh, uh, correctly, I believe, um, that your gender doesn't necessarily have uh, determine, is, is not necessarily determined by your biology, it isn't determined by your, your biolo biology. Um, and in the 20 years or so since I've written, since I wrote this book, I think um, there are many more people who accept that fact, which I think is a, a really great development. Um, so. And um, in the second sex, uh, the reason many. The second sex, sex is a meditation on the relationship with me, between women and philosophy. Uh, what is the most important lesson we can learn from it today, more than 70 years after it's released? So this is the biggest, the most huge uh, work about uh, feminist philosophy, but 
What is the most important lesson in uh, your opinion? Um, do you mean from my own work or just generally speaking? Mm, both. Mm, there are differences. Sure, and I don't know if there's anything about my work <laughs> um, that makes this um, interesting. Um, but I think the most important thing um, that we have learned is that to have um, chromosomes and um, sex organs um, and other biological marks and features of uh, being uh, a man or a woman or intersex or whatever your physical body um, seems to suggest, so male, female uh, at a biological level or intersex does not necessarily say anything about what your gender is. Um, and yet at the same time, it remains the case that individuals who are women um, or trans women um, continue to um, have very particular kinds of issues and problems um, that we still have to work on. Um, and we also, I think, are in a place in which it's obviously clear that you can't simply um, talk about sex and gender um, on the one hand, um, and then sort of everything else about a person's life on the other hand. Um, there are um, as many ways to uh, experience and have to fight against sexism as there are individuals um, who are women. In your opinion, what was um, what do you think about the ongoing feminist debate in the U.S.? Because in in Italy, in this moment, we are so many debates about politically correct and feminism. Feminism is, is uh, seen as a huge monster uh, <laughs> and uh, a huge um, like like the. Uh, I don't know, it's like uh, soldiers that are occupying uh, all spaces, digital spaces and places in, uh, in the public space. And uh, so uh, lots of people are frightened by this, are afraid to lose uh, freedom, etc. Uh, what's going um, instead in the US? And uh, what is the, um, have you seen uh, um, a change in this uh, in the last uh, years? Yes, um, really great question. These are all good questions. Thank you. Um, so I think right now in the uh, in the U.S., it's it's people are fond of saying that we're really polarized. I think there are quite a few people who are somewhere in the middle, but it is true. Um, uh, the uh, very robust system of universities and colleges in the U.S. Um, and uh, are full of students. Um, in, in, in all over the country who are very, very, very progressive. Um, and when it comes to gender, people are very uh, aggressively, um, I think wonderfully um, understanding that uh, the um, people's genders matter uh, very much to most people, not everybody, but many people and that there, nothing, the world will not collapse. No bad things are going to happen um, if, uh, no terrible things are going to happen if we simply respect um, other people's genders, whatever they tell us they may be. And of course, a huge change in the US is that the, the Supreme Court of the United States agreed with that. And it's now uh, not all right to be harassed or, or discriminated against on the basis of being trans. Um, and it's common at all, or not all, not the most conservative, but most universities and colleges for people to routinely introduce themselves, say in a classroom um, or in a meeting by saying, you know, my name's Nancy Bauer. Um, I use the she series of pronouns um, or to people to put that on their Zoom meetings or their Skype or whatever it happens to be. Um, and I think this is an absolutely fantastic um, development. Um, it, what it does is take, it, 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 what's interesting is it's in effect suggesting that people's bodily uh, equipment <laughs> um, does not necessarily have anything to do with the way they wish to comport themselves, how they dress, uh, you know, whether they wear makeup or not, 
etc. cetera. Um, and it also doesn't have anything to do with whom they love uh, physically or emotionally. And uh, one sees that um, the kind of relaxation that has happened in many places in the US um, has not led to a crisis. Um, and insofar <clears throat> as it's now the law of the land that you can't discriminate against trans people um, in your hiring practices, uh, for example, there has been a very quick change. Um, it reminds me of the another wonderful change that happened. So in the 1980s, of course, into the 90s, there was the terrible crisis with AIDS, um, with men getting uh, mostly gay men, or not mostly, well, mostly gay men, but not only gay men, getting very, very sick with acquired immunodeficiency disorder and dying. Um, and of course, that created a back, a yet another backlash against gay men but somehow or other, it also led within 10 years of that crisis um, being abated by good drugs, et cetera, to gay marriage being allowable. That started in Massachusetts where I live. Um, and that's been happening um, now uh, for you know a couple of decades. And I, I no, no, nothing horrible has happened. Uh, and so I think these are um, very, very profound changes um, that, are laying the ground for other kinds of social movements uh, where I think that, that are much more intractable and difficult to, um, and have a, a much harder uh, project ahead of them. And I'm thinking here particularly of race in the US. Yes. Thank you. Nancy Barra, uh, according to you, what is, this is a, a big question, <laughs> what is the deepest meaning of being feminist? And uh, what is the, um, the deepest meaning of being a philosopher? Okay, um, so I'll do first the deepest meaning of a fe being a feminist and then of being a philosopher. Um, what I have to say here is even more controversial probably than what I've already said. Um, but to be a feminist is to believe uh, deeply that um, the two things. One is very simple, which is that whatever your biological uh, sex-related organs <laughs> or um, chromosomal uh, um, arrangements in your body, whatever your chromosomes are, um, how you comport yourself in the everyday world or in any setting that, or that isn't very strict, uh, um, you know, um, so for example, I'm not talking about whether people should wear uniforms in the military. I don't have a view on that. But in any other kind of setting, I think uh, what people's chromosomes are like and what their what bodily parts they have should have nothing to do about how whether they you know wear makeup, um, have very very short hair, um, swagger like a traditional man. Um, um, Ha, act uh, uh, in a very feminine way. Um, and it also should, we should, I also believe uh, that people should um, uh, be allowed to use whatever pronouns they wish. There is, a, interestingly, within the Anglophone world, in the US, uh, uh, <clears throat> feminist philosophers tend to be uh, very much uh, on the same page as what I just spelled out. In the in the UK, there is a very strong movement among some feminist uh, philosophers to um, be extremely unhappy about, um, in particular, trans women um, on the grounds that trans women uh, can make um, uh, cis women um, un feel unsafe. They can go, trans women can go into, for example, uh, public um, washrooms and um, assault women there. Um, I'll talk more about that if you wish, but I think that is insane, bizarre. There's no evidence of this. Um, it, it, to the contrary, uh, most trans women are very vulnerable and very, in my opinion, um, brave. But I, I think this change is, um, uh, is great and it's the future. But people still talk about doing feminist philosophy because a feminist philosophy has done a lot of work that have contributed has contributed um, at least at an intellectual level. And that means for in on all college campuses to this huge change. Um, so we give students the, um, the concepts, the theory, 
um, the, um, the vision the sense of what the problem is to get back to that, um, to be able to um, take this um, their this sense of gender fluidity um, into their everyday lives. And I'm really excited about the up and coming generation of students. I think they have much more uh, love in their hearts and are much more tolerant. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. And about philosophy, um, I think that's a really tricky question. Um, in the United States, there's an establishment of uh, analytic philosophy is far more um, dominant, is dominant. And what uh, most uh, philosophers in the world do, um, from Chinese philosophers to European philosophers, um, tends to be uh, what um, non-philosophers think is philosophy. That is to think in a big picture way about um, even getting into the details about what, what, who we are and what's going on and what the world is like and what our possibilities are and how we should behave and all of that stuff. Um, in the US and, and the UK, at least, feminist philosophy has become a force to reckon with. And I'm very excited to say that I think philosophy of race has now suddenly, um, especially um, in the wake of the events in the United States last summer involving um, George Floyd, uh, um, I think that uh, philosophy of race has now become a priority um, in philosophy in a way that it wasn't before. Um, and I think that's a great thing. Also for a number of years, um, I'm gonna say, I don't know, uh, almost, maybe almost a hundred years, <laughs> there's been a kind of uh, tension between analytic philosophy and what in the US we call continental philosophy. So that is between philosophy that is uh, driven by uh, logic and perspicuousness and carefulness and is in some ways like science. Philosophy is a kind of science where people are working together on problems. Um, and then the other option would have been um, continental philosophy, which is what most people in the world uh, who are not um, in the Far East think of philosophy. And then in addition to that, um, um, Eastern um, philosophy, I think there's a lot of, I think that, that those distinctions are starting to break down. Um, and I think that um, people are thinking about the question that I have cared about for my whole career, which is what is philosophy for? What are we doing? Um, we don't fit well in the university because we are not making empirical discoveries that others can build on to refine or ultimately show are wrong or whatever, though a lot of analytic philosophers behave that way. I think our job is to put into words um, the, the to, to do sort of, um, to reflect on the zeitgeist um, in a way that is not um, superficial. To think about sort of this thing is developing, how do we handle it? How do we deal with it? How do we um, engage in conversation with other people so that everybody has a say, but we're also making progress? And it doesn't necessarily have to be about social issues, but I think it uh, just about social issues, but I, I think it's extremely important um, especially in the world we live in now, uh, where everything is so precarious that philosophers make sure that we still have a place. Uh, in the US, this is always less secure than, than in other places that value philosophy, but that philosophers have, are, are trying to um, um, start conversations that matter um, in the world um, that go beyond what you're going to read in the popular press. I just think that's extreme. I think it's one extremely important function of what we do. I agree. Uh, you wrote an essay on pornography, how to do things with pornography. Um, what attracted you to this topic and what role does pornography play in your opinion in a society where women's bodies are constantly under scrutiny? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, uh, so um, the book that I wrote um, on pornography um, began with my just starting to think about why 
there was so much literature in feminist philosophy, particularly analytic feminist philosophy, that was endless, endless articles talking about why pornography was terrible, it was bad for women, um, it was it constituted a kind of silencing of women, and it constituted um, a kind of assault against women. Um, and I thought to myself, um, this is such a superficial, um, it was just, you know, a continuation of a very long conversation that's been happening um, for at least 30 years um, as pornography has um, really just become ubiquitous. And a lot of this work was trying to take the work of the feminist um, legal theorist, Catherine McKinnon, um, who's a very famous, um, she's actually a very well-known person in the United States who argued for quite some time and still can argue that, um, that we should make um, the trafficking in pornography, make uh, porn pornographic, uh, trying to sell pornographic things and uh, uh, um, should, should be, um, should be regulated by law um, and that people should be held accountable uh, for the harms that come to women through the making of pornography and through the dissemination of pornography. I think Catherine McKinnon is a genius. I don't agree with everything she says. She is one of my favorite writers. She is the such, such a powerful voice and she her arguments are also really interesting um, and and thought provoking. And for me, uh, philosophy being thought provoking, or in her case, legal theories being thought provoking is huge plus. But there developed in the Anglophone philosophy world, a huge um, literature um, on trying to bolster McKinnon's views with, with some analytic philosophy. And this enraged me because I thought, she doesn't need to have her views bolstered. And I, one time I was at a conference with her and I, I asked her about this. And she said, yeah, I don't know. I did all this work. What do they think they have to explain it? Anybody can read my books. And I had that same, I was so happy when she said that. So at first I started thinking, why are people doing this? But also I thought a lot of what they were saying about pornography was not really about pornography. It was about their fantasy conception of pornography. And I once asked one of the main people writing in this huge cottage industry that started to burgeon about, um, you know, what's wrong with pornography? It just became this, this thing that everybody was doing. And I asked the person who had started it, you know, like, um, well, like how much pornography have you actually looked at? And she said to me, none, I would never look at pornography. And I said, never, no, no pornography ever. You've never, this is, this was in the, you know, probably mid 1990s when it was a little bit less ubiquitous than it is now, at least on the internet. And she said, no, no, I'll never, never gonna look at this. And I thought this was just unbelievable. Like, you know, why aren't you gonna look at it? Um, and she just said, I don't need to look at it. And I, I said, you don't have to buy it. You know, I'll find you some, I'll give it to you. Go or go, there's plenty of free stuff on the internet, go look at it. Um, so anyway, but what I thought is that there is something about um, pornography that is problematic and the something is, so I started thinking about this. So I wrote a, an essay called How to Do Things with Pornography. And then I realized I had more to say about that. So I ended up writing a book and the book, people hate this about this book. It starts off being about pornography and sex and it ends up being about philosophy because I was just as upset that philosophers could not actually get to the thing itself and actually talk about pornography. There's one person I know who is an, also an art historian who does that work really well, but most people weren't. And I thought they're talk, they're this, and I, then I thought, why do this? Who's gonna, how's it, what kind of influence is it gonna have on the world? This is a real world issue. Why are we, yeah, I just started thinking like, what's philosophy now? You can write about pornography, but you don't have to look at it, but you also don't have to be addressing like a legal audience or, so I found this all bizarre. So most of my work in some way, shape or form is somehow is on, you know, what is philosophy and why do we do it? And part of that is because my advisor um, in grad school, uh, who's, and I'm now his liter, one of his literary executors, we're about to put out a book of his work is Stanley Cavell. And Stanley 
was always thinking, you know, what is philosophy doing and what is it good for? And I, I think that's an important question to always bear in mind. Um, and so what I wanted to try to show was that um, there are things that we could do about um, sexism and about sexual assault. Um, and, um, and if we only did philosophy in a different way. So over the course of the book, it starts out being about pornography and it ends up being about how do you write philosophically in a way, if you want to, that actually has an effect on the world. So presumably, if you're upset about pornography, you wanna actually change it in the world. So why are you writing these articles back and forth to various philosophers? One answer is because then students read this work and they get upset about pornography, but I'm not sure that's always true. Um, I think sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. And I also think it's the real world that needs to be thinking about these things as well, outside of the academy. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Nancy Bauer. I am I'm so happy to, <laughs> to have been uh, uh, had uh, the opportunity to talk with you and uh, thank you for being here in the Festa de la Filosofia. Well, Maura, thank you so much. Um, sorry for my really long responses. I love talking about this. I'm really thrilled to have had this, this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.